next up we have um, Debbie Guest from the Royal Veterinary College. Um, her research has been mainly aimed at stem cells and trying to look at genetic factors that could link to diseases and especially catastrophic factors in thoroughbred fractures. So she'll be talking to us today on developing new tools um, to reduce catastrophic fractures in thoroughbreds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to talk to you today. So I'm going to be coming from a slightly different angle because we were interested in the genetic risk that's involved in fracture. And this is work that was initiated a long time ago at the Animal Health Trust where I was previously based and since then has moved down to the Royal Veterinary College with me. So we've heard from some of the other speakers today already about the incidence of fracture and these are the incidences per thousand horse starts <coughs> which always strike me as been quite low when you think of it in that perspective. But within the UK, catastrophic fractures are still the leading cause of euthanasia on the race course. It's about 60 horses a year, and this number has stayed relatively static. So we know that fractures are complex condition. We've heard already about some of the environmental risk factors that increase the chances of this happening. But what previous research at the Animal Health Trust showed is that actually there is a genetic component to fracture risk as well. So the heritability is about 0.3. So what that means is that about 30% of the variation in risk across the population is due to genetics, which to put it into some perspective is about the same as milk yield in Holstein cows. But we know that this is a complex disease with multiple chromosomes involved. So when you think of a single gene disease, it's likely you've got one DNA variant at one chromosome or position, and whether you inherit one or two copies of that will go on to say when, whether you get the disease. But in a complex disease like fracture, we've got multiple variants spread across the genome, and how those variants interact with each other, as well as how they interact with the environmental risk factors, will go on to say whether the horse actually has a fracture or not. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do was to try to develop a way where we could identify the horses that were genetically at the highest risk. So we had DNA from 269 fracture cases, 253 controls. And those samples were genotyped for 50,000 markers that were spread across the genome. And essentially then we use some uh, computational software which basically just weights each marker based on how well associated it is with fracture. So then for an individual horse, you can generate a risk score based on the combination of markers that it has. So what you can see on the graph on the bottom right is the fracture score, the number of horses up the y-axis, and then you can see the cases and the controls separate as two different groups. But really, we selected these horses on the basis that we knew that they were cases or we knew that they were controls, so we'd kind of expect these to sit at the um, extremes of the risk spectrum. So I think what's more interesting is, well, what does the general thoroughbred population look like? And what you can see with the grey bars <coughs> is the scores of 382 thoroughbreds where we'd selected them on no phenotypic associations with fracture. So we didn't know anything about their fracture status. And what you can see again is we've got a normal uh, distribution, but it's sort of spanning more evenly that risk spectrum. So if we take that data and just plot it slightly differently, so we've got the fracture risk score along the bottom, but now each of those 382 thoroughbreds is represented by a bar running up and down the graph. And then we can start to make some cutoffs. So if I was to risk score a new horse now from um, one of you guys in Newmarket and it found that it had a score above zero, we'd be able to say, look, genetically, this horse really is at quite high risk because only 11% of thoroughbreds in that general population are going to have a scar this high. Likewise, we could identify horses in the bottom 10%, or you can make your cutoffs wherever you like. So I think this is a really powerful way of being able to help us to identify horses that are going to be at more risk, so that we can do something more about them, either using mo closer monitoring via diagnostic techniques that we've already heard about, potentially altering their training and racing regimes and helping to make informed breeding decisions. 
But what we're really interested in is, well, why are these horses at high risk? What makes them at high risk? What biological mechanisms are actually involved that's causing this? So we know that there's been lots of previous studies where they've looked at fractured bones from, uh, bones from fractured cases and fracture controls. And we know that in the fracture cases, we get all this accumulation of micro damage. But it's not really telling us anything about what biological processes are underpinning that. And these studies are really complicated because all the horses have been exposed to different envi um, environmental risk factors. And obviously, we can only look at the end when the horse is dead. So what we wondered is whether we could use a cell-based model so that we could really take a much more focused look at things, but with really great control for any environmental variability. And when we're thinking about establishing these cell-based models, we had a number of options. So it's very difficult to work with primary bone cells. They don't like to grow in culture. You can't expand them, so there's not much that we can do with them. And obviously, these are going to have always also been exposed to the same factors as the bone tissue itself. So the age of the horse, what environmental risk factors it's been exposed to. We could work with progenitor cells, and I'll talk about some of our work that we've done using those. <clears throat> so these are cells that will grow to a certain degree in culture and that you can turn into bone cells. But they will also be affected by certain factors like the age of the horse. So the gold standard that's used in human medicine at the moment to study inherited diseases is the use of induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can generate these by taking any cell type of the body, reprogramming it back into this pluripotent state. And once it reaches that state, the, these cells will grow forever in the lab. They also have the capacity to turn into all of the cell types of the body, so they're really useful for generating those cells that don't grow very well or that come from tissues that are difficult to access. And the other important factor about them is during this reprogramming step, we've set the epigenetic clock back to zero. So any implications of age and training and other, other factors that will have built up have all been reset. So what we started doing was to bank cells from over 40 different thoroughbreds where, again, phenotypically we knew nothing about their factor status. We risk scored them using our algorithm. And then we selected cells that were either at the very lowest end or the very highest end of that risk spectrum. We turned them into IPS cells in duplicate or triplicate, turned them into the cells that form bone, and then performed RNA sequencing. So what this allowed us to do was to take this really unbiased approach so we could measure the expression of every single gene. So I don't have time to go into all the detailed results, but this is to just give you some of the highlights from it. So what you can see is a heat map where the more red it is, the higher that gene is expressed, and the more bluey yellow it is, the lower the expression level is. And the blue columns, we've got our low risk samples, and in the red columns, we've got the high risk samples. So we identified 112 genes that were significantly differentially expressed. And you can see they form two groups, those that are expressed more highly in the high-risk samples, those that are expressed more highly in the low-risk samples. And what's quite interesting is that a third of those genes already have a published role in either bone formation or fracture. So we don't know how they're contributing to fracture risk in the horse, but they are potentially very interesting things to look into more. Overall, those genes are involved in lots of different processes, but one of the pathways that's come out time and time again in our different analyses are things to do with the control of the extracellular matrix. So what we're trying to do now in further work that's been funded is to work out, well, what are some, how are these genes involved in creating fracture risk in the horse? And presumably, the differences in these gene expression are fundamentally coming from differences in the DNA of those horses. So what are the DNA variants that are underpinning these results? <coughs> so to give you an idea of the, the type of work that we can do for that, I've made it sound super easy. You show the results in one slide, but generating all of these sort of lines took years and years and years. Um, so although it's a great resource that we've got now, it was taking a long time. So what we did in the meantime was just to take our low and high risk fibroblasts and turn them straight into the bone forming cells. And then we had to look at some of the genes that we just thought might be interesting. 
And these genes we selected on the basis that they resided within this region here, which is on chromosome 18, and was identified in the initial studies as being significantly associated with fracture. So it's a really interesting region. It's a really big region. It's got lots of genes in it. But proportionally, a large number of those genes are already known to be involved in either bone or fracture. So all those ones highlighted in yellow. So we thought, well, let's have a look at what, hap what is happening to those yellow genes. And what we found is that in the case of the gene STAT1, this was expressed at significantly higher levels in the high-risk horses. Now, biologically, this probably makes sense, because if you knock STAT1 out of mice, then those mice have an increased bone mineral density and mineral content. We know that inhibiting STAT1 accelerates fracture repair, and in cells, we know that STAT1 inhibits bone formation. So the fact that our samples from the high-risk courses have a higher level is probably a bad thing. In contrast, collagen-3 showed us the opposite pattern. But again, this um, fit with what we know about the function of this gene biologically. So in humans, if you have mutations in the gene, you have low bone mass and a tendency to fracture. In mice, if we knock out the gene, again, we get reduced bone volume and bone density, and we know the gene is required for the bone-forming cells. So the fact that our high-risk horse has had this lower level of the gene, probably not good. So <coughs> we did quite a lot of experiments then in cells, which, to be honest, you're probably not that interested in, although this is you know, my, my life and my world. But I'm just going to summarize the model that we were able to develop from using these cell-based tools. So what we know is that in the control horses or the genetically low-risk horses, we have high levels of this collagen-3 gene. In the case horses, we have much lower levels. What we identified is that just upstream of that collagen-3 gene, in the control horses, they were more likely to have a T allele as, a DNA, as the DNA variant, whereas in the case horses, they were more likely to have a G at that position. We went on to show that this region that encompasses this DNA variant has promoter activity, which means it's able to control how much of the gene that's adjacent to it is turned on or turned off. And then what we we're able to demonstrate is that when you've got this T DNA variant at that position, it allows high levels of protein binding, in particular SOX11, which directly controls how much of the collagen 3 gene that we have. Whereas in the case horses, having that G variant gives less SOX11 binding and therefore less gene transcription. So this system's really allowed us to get this detailed insight as to how DNA changes are actually regulating genes that are involved in fracture. In terms of this polygenic risk scoring test, I know Tim talked about it at the beginning, about the importance of validating things. We've got this work underway at the moment. This is preliminary data. Our sample sizes still need building up, but it's looking promising that in a new cohort of cases and controls, on average, the cases have a higher risk score than the controls do. But I'd also like to just point out that these cell-based studies, the only way that we selected the cells was on the basis of their fracture risk score using our scoring system. And I think the fact that we've identified these differences between the groups that biologically make sense, as well as having the power then to be able to identify new DNA variants which um, cause these differences, really helps us to you know, to really illustrate how powerful this test is at, being at identifying the different risk scores. So we know fractures this hugely significant welfare problem in thoroughbreds. Using genome-wide information, we've developed this polygenic fracture risk scoring test so we can identify high-risk horses. And we've used this to establish cell culture models, which I think are going to give us a really powerful way of understanding, well, why are some horses more predisposed to others? So I'd just like to thank all of the funders who funded the work over the years, the people who are currently up, uh, involved in the project and have helped in the past, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Debbie. That was very interesting and definitely something new to me, so really interesting to listen to that.